right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica. I'm the owner of the store, and we are so excited tonight to be hosting this event with Jesse Yuzhevska Stevens, presenting her brand new book, The Visitors. And she's going to be talking with Christian Lorenzen, so you are in for an excellent evening. Uh, before I turn things over to them, just a couple of housekeeping things to remind you of. If you have a cell phone or something else that might make noise during the event, now is a good time to silence it. We do ask that folks keep their masks on the whole evening, except when they're up here on stage. Thank you for um, working together to keep our community safe. Um, and we do have signed copies of the visitors for sale up in the register up front. And if you would like your signed copy personalized by Jesse, you can go buy it up front and bring it back here to the podium where she will be inscribing them by request after the event. So we appreciate your support. That buying the book not only supports the author, but it supports this local independent bookstore and allows us to continue to bring you free events like this one. So we thank you in advance for that. We are recording tonight's event on video. And if all goes well, we'll post the recording on YouTube. So if you miss anything, you can check it out again later. All right, our interviewer for this evening is the eminent book critic and actor Christian Lorenzen. His reviews have appeared in the London Review of Books, Harper's, and many other publications, and he's currently appearing in play Dime Square. He's going to be speaking with our featured author, Jesse Yuzhevska Stevens. Her stories and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The Nation, The New York Times, Foreign Policy, The Paris Review, Tin House, and elsewhere. And she holds a BA in Mathematics from Middlebury College and an MFA from Columbia University and lives in New York and Geneva. So her new novel, The Visitors, is a mordantly funny tour through a world where not only civic infrastructure, but our darkest desires, not to mention our novels, are vulnerable to malware where mythical creatures talk like Don DeLillo, where love is little more than a blip in our metadata. It peers into how we got here and asks what we do next, charting the last days of a broken status quo as the path is cleared for something new. So this book is a big favorite of our staff and we're really excited to have Jesse here tonight. She's gonna to be reading from the book first and then Christian will join her in conversation and you'll have the chance to ask your questions after that. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Jesse Jessica Stevens. Nothing left to do but perform. 
It is an act of generosity to break the monotony, to cleave a day into two acts that may be compared. All one needs in order to feel is juxtaposition, to fold a life along the perforated line of an event horizon. She accepts this calling. She is calm. The old trees sway overhead. She is warm inside her coat, the lining sticking to her dewy skin. The bra straps slide down her shoulders and are not corrected. She is so warm, hot. She undoes the buttons, the scarf, revels in the cold. Hello, no, she says aloud. He is bobbing at her side, though it's a shame she can't quite see him. She wonders if he's cold. What is there to teach? This is an age for the monologue, for wisdom gotten cheap, the flimsy forms of people speaking nonsense. There's not so much in one's control, not much to do, but crouch at the loom of one's own life and draw the shuttle through the preloaded pattern of the war. What you see is what you get, and what you see is all there is. The challenge is to think in threads, never see the whole. Don't look up. Every creation fails its original conception, especially when everyone already knows what you're going to become. They've been watching, anticipating. Foliage falls through the air. The sun transforms leaves to licks of flame, and the wreckage lands at sea's feet. She wades, climbs a hill through the brush, over a low wall, meet cement. Buildings rise and compress the world. In Midtown, she steps into a department store. No one kicks her out. She moves through the slick glitter of the cosmetic counters in her bra and trench, chest bare, coat open, her belly soft and vulnerable. At a mirror, she draws a knob of lipstick across her lips, sinks a sample brush, into a tube of mascara and adorns her lashes. The perfumes are an enchantment. They have such immaterial names. Allure, temptation, ecstasy. A saleswoman shoes her away. She remembers how, with Max, the sex was contained between satisfactory extremes, never too numb, never passionate, neither ecstasy nor salvation but always tender in its caution and incapable of lasting harm. There was a time leading up to his departure, but before departure was inevitable, when she complained of a pressure in her cervix. It was a vague, dull, and distracting pain. She offered this information to him, and later, when he was leaving, but before he left, the pressure subsided, things changed. In any case, he was thrusting differently, and the pain had stopped. Drifting through the department store, she is moved by his tenderness. What she cannot remember is why it disappeared, or where it went. It seems to her it vanished of its own accord, abandoned her, as does sometimes, the gnome. She imagines Max's search history on female anatomy, filtering through the financial plumbing, flowing into the stock price of lifestyle products. And here she is. But where is the gnome? She looks around her now, rouged cheekbones flashing in the fluorescent lights. The department store is a hall of mirrors carapaced with cosmetics. Every surface gleams. Magenta dress dresses coagulate into a fleshy entrance, beckoning. See closes her eyes. It is difficult to concentrate amid the shine and the brass the accessories capped in gold. She forgets what she is looking for, reaches for another tube of lipstick and draws a deep gash along her wrist. Another mouth misplaced. C admires the cosmetic wound. This is surely why flowers are so beautiful, why the little girls love them so. They do not have mouths. They do not consume the original sin they have no need for an organ so crude as the tongue. She hums in relief, admires her wrists. Soon she too will be a flower, will wreathe herself in petals, self-protected.
She swats at the edges of this fantasy as if to chase a lay of fly. The gnome darts out of the way. He is whispering, offering advice, but now he can't get it. The gnome has learned a great deal about human life in the months he's trailed sea. He understands the toaster, the dryer, the dangers of inserting a fork into the toaster to extract a slice of bread, and also recklessness. Sea fishes daily for her chosen reports. He understands the shower, sometimes hot means hot, other times cold. He is familiar with the origin of the universe as seen from a human perspective. Nothing, nothing, then language, then the world. He has studied how little humans understand themselves, how incapable they are of thinking ahead, how fragile the architecture of the human mind is riddled by rivers of desire whose currents always shift. Consume, consume. There is no static equilibrium of preference. If only they could abstain from activities that cause them harm. But apparently, he knows this too, there is some pleasure in the pain. He has seen children build their block towers only to topple them. Towers, he's concluded, are built to be smashed. He understands C's intentions as she traipses down 6th Ave, gnawing a candy bar, and by logical extension, he must approve of the plan. mid-century European uh, hysteria, <laughs> then I like to see myself as, as so if that spectrum exists, um, then I, I would like to see myself as, uh, as somewhere on it. Um, and I guess I think of novels as things, as, as forms that give ideas um, time that, that don't have time uh, in themselves. So if you want to write about the financial system, um, as I have here, if you want to write about um, the uh, financial crisis, um, you need to, uh, we need to frame it in a way such that it registers emotionally um, uh, differently than it does uh, in the news cycle and in our everyday lives. 
um, and I find the, uh, the personal um, the, the way into that. Um, and I suppose I also think that we, um, I mean, the book deals with recent history. We have the financial crisis, we have Occupy, and I also think that we um, feel that recent history differently when we experience it uh, mostly through how it affects um, relationships, through how it manifests in the psychological effects on, on the character. Um, and to me, that's, uh, that's, that's the reason to write, that's where the fascination lies. Would you say that in some ways, the, <coughs> obviously, C is a character who, in consensus reality terms, shall we say, it might be described as uh, being mentally ill, and yet, um, her author does not say send her to therapy, although she does spend quite a bit of time in hospitals despite not her relationship to health insurance is rather tenuous. Probably um, relationship relate, here, relate right? to. Um, uh, are her symptoms the symptoms of a system or systems that are breaking down as John Ashford and I put it in a poem, I'm sure. Um, I, I would say uh, yes. <laughs> so I think that, um, you know, but in, in the way that you put it, I mean, I think certainly there's a mental health crisis in this country, in the city. I think this is obviously related to failures of um, our, our social and economic system. Um, I also think that uh, there is still, that one thing that fiction can still do I guess he sort of opened this a little bit in contrast to um, a realist mode, a dominant realist mode. But I think that one thing that fiction can still do is find spaces for those enchanted moments or darkly enchanted mo moments and even a bit of the magical um, in, in our lives uh, that maybe we can later um, rationalize, uh, but that in the moment um, feels kind of haunted. Um, and I think that this is separate even um, from uh, mental health crises that, that we um, that we discuss that, that we write about in, in other ways. I mean, for example, um, when when I was younger, I did spend some time in the hospital. I was in this accident, and I was having all these surgeries, but I wouldn't always know <laughs> that I was having surgery. And and I would wake up, and I'd be coming out of anesthesia, but I wouldn't have known. And in this children's hospital, all of the murals on the, you know, octopuses and these sorts of things, they're all moving, you know? And I, I really wonder, what is going on, right? Um, and, and I think that there are experiences um, that we still, there are still moments like that in life um, that are not pathologized, but that also, um, to get to the second half of your question, but that also dramatize really that um, kind of gaslighting experience of thinking that you're living in one system, playing by one set of rules, and then feeling um, as, you know, uh, after the financial crisis, um, that uh, the rules of the system you thought were playing by, they, they don't apply at all, right? Um, and that, uh, that sort of um, surreal experience, or the way in which, um, America seems often set up to uh, let people fail and then tell them that it's their fault. <laughs> and, and, this, and this kind of uh, surreal experience of I really thought that the world was one way and then suddenly all the rules are broken. There's something um, dark and haunted about those moments that I hope the book uh, in its, in this like elements of absurdist magic elements that are present here capture that atmosphere that I think uh, relates to what it's like to be alive in a sort of gaslighting moment. Speaking of rules, the gnome. <laughs> and I thought it was, it was I, it hadn't occurred to me this connection until the introduction where it was said that the gnome speaks like a Don DeLillo character or something like that because one of the cliches about his dialogue is that it's always called gnomic. <laughs> um, uh, at least Beginning from, I think I, I think I first encountered that in like a write up in Spin magazine or maybe talk. Uh, in any case, the gnome shows up. 
out of nowhere, take, occupies, sees apartment, sometimes is to be seen falling asleep on furniture or maybe like an alarm clock or something. Pretending to sleep. He has the power of hovering. Uh, he knows vast amounts of information, which made me think he might be a metaphor for a phone or the internet itself at times. He's also male, and there are a lot of missing males in this book, which might include fathers, a, a divorced husband, unborn children. Um, what? And then later we learn that even though he knows all of this stuff, he's also been learning a lot. I guess my question is, and I don't want you to give too much away, but were there rules that you set up that governed the gnome's presence in the novel? Yeah, the gnome rules yeah. and the, the world building yeah. of this. Yeah. Um, so. And maybe also how did the gnome come? How did he appear? Yeah. Did he <laughs> Um, so, two things that I, I can't always quite recreate uh, my process of writing a book. I hear authors say a lot, oh, I wrote five drafts, I wrote seven drafts, and I feel like there's always one draft, and some days I cut a hundred pages, and then I, I continue writing. So, um, but, but one, one thing, the, the two things that were always uh, very consistent in this book is there always was the mill, um, and I always knew the ending. Um, and the, the gnome is not super familiar with uh, human life, um, but he knows a lot about uh, finance, he knows a lot about uh, the electrical grid. So one thing we haven't mentioned is that this is kind of an alternative history of Occupy. There is a, uh, or, or of this period, and there, off stage, there is an eco-hacktivist group, um, eco-anarchist hacktivist group, well, good night, and they're trying to take down the national grid, sort of raise everything and, and start from, from scratch. The gnome knows a lot about this, he knows a lot about the national grid, he knows a lot about, um, about these plans. In terms of, and again, without giving too much away, um, but because I had always known the, the ending, I knew that there was going to be this arc too where C would sort of pull away from consensus reality uh, throughout the book and that the more uh, real this relationship with the visitor uh, becomes, then the less connected uh, she is to, to consensus reality. So when he first arrives, she has rules for herself. I'm not gonna talk to this, I'm just gonna ignore this my visitor, and it will, you know, he'll, he'll go away. And then she, she gives in, she starts talking. At, at first, you know, the gnome is always in her apartment, and then this visitor begins, you know, by the end of the book, uh, to follow her. Um, wherever uh, well, she, she tends goes. to evict them. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and then by the end, she—they're both evicted. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I think there, there was this way that this um, the reality of their relationship is really inversely uh, correlated um, to her ability uh, to still exist uh, in the world and. Uh, C is, she's a fairly apolitical character. When, when we meet her, she sort of just wants to be um, left alone to, to deal with her life and you know, make, make her art as, as she would like. Um, and uh, she's tried to play by the rules of the system in order to do that, and it hasn't worked out. So. Uh, speaking of politics and another character, there's a character called the Professor. Mm -hmm. And at first, he's kind of in the, the novel as a a romantic rival in the way of seas. And then as Occupy transpires, he is a presence uh, in the park, um, lecturing essentially, or doing seminars or working groups or whatever they're called there. And so I, the first questions I began to ask in my head, because I didn't necessarily expect that term, I had I was living in London at the time of Occupy, but I did attend a lecture at St. Paul's or talk or speech by uh, David Harvey, and then the Marxist economist, and um, <clears throat> and then another figure you might have expected a character called the Professor to be based on would be say David Graeber. Um, 
professor is not like those two characters. And in fact, he is, it is questionable where his allegiances lie, um, given the theories he talks about. He's, well, he seems to me, would it be inaccurate to describe him as a pro-market? In that, okay. accurate. Accurate, yes, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, I think, you know, so there are a number of influences that went into the um, professor. So I, when I was researching the book, I was coming across, I read so many blog posts, I read um, uh, a, a lot of um, you know, personal accounts of Occupy, and I came across a number of um, scholars or academics or anthropologists who were visiting the park you know, as, as a research opportunity. Um, and this was interesting to me. There, there's some, there's maybe something um, in the relationship of uh, some visitor to her that is also a bit of a research relationship of the narrator to the characters, um, you know, researching uh, these, these subjects. Um, and then I think that um, Patrick Hayek was really a, um, a you know, sort of now known as father um, was was very much an, an influence on the professor as well. And I think that there is, the, the deepest root in the book um, is maybe uh, the sense that trust in the usual means of communicating the public will uh, through the usual um, business as usual modes of protest of the democratic vote um, of art uh, is out of low. <laughs> and so what what modes of expression do we still have? And there's a 13 ways of uh, looking at something element of the book. And one thing that I was interested in was, um, you know, if this is all a huge failure of communication, um, in what ways do some people believe that markets are a means of communication? He says the markets are the means of delivering information, the best means exactly. we have, and that the reason that there's no revolution or revolution, the obstacle to revolution is one of the distribution of information and coordination. Right? Yes. That's what he says. Yeah. So I was like, I was just somewhat shocked. I was shocked and kind of perversely delighted, shall we say, to find hear someone saying that on those, <laughs> in that context. Yeah. Um, His remarks I, are not welcome. No, they, but. No, 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 people are not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the role of, to take it in another different direction, the role of art, and I guess there will be two works of art that um, see, creates a figure. One is has a title. Uh, women working with their hands, or whoa, whoa, WTH, <laughs> yeah. and then another that only emerges late in the book, which shall be honest, is, is not. But um, where I've experienced a weaver, because these are tapestries that she's woven, and right. you certainly explain the language. Uh, in, in the passage you just read of weaving and the machinery of what is it called? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, I have some blind spots. <laughs> um, there are worse ones, but we. <laughs> and it did it did strike me that it's a system. It it it, it was a, an art form that immediately plugged into the larger overall metaphors of systems throughout this book that go from, you know, the internet and just the connection of the electrical grid to the financial system to the digestive system, etc. Um, and then you have the, there's kind of a post epigraph from Annie Albert. Yeah, yeah. From an essay called a book or an essay called On Weaving. <laughs> from the, yeah. Yeah. So tell us about that. I would point out the Yeah. Um, so, so Annie Albers um, is, is uh, was influential in my my weaving research. But while I am not a weaver, 
Right. All progress, so it seems, is coupled to regression elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so I should say that, first and foremost, my mother is actually a weaver uh -huh. and quite talented. Um, and and uh, she had been becoming ever more uh, talented <laughs> while I was I was um, beginning this novel. And we would talk about this, and we would talk about color theory. My mother was um, uh, you know doing all of this all of this research herself. And then when I would visit, I'm like, man, this moo is really loud. <laughs> you know? uh, it's, um, and you know, and so I I I had this. Um, uh, first row seat um, and, and uh, watching someone read and seeing what it looks like and seeing the planning uh, going into this. And then I was reading a lot of Annie Albers, who I just find such a wonderful writer, and I found that so much that she was writing about with relation to weaving um, and in describing her, uh, her work and her approach to her art reminded me so much of writing. And there's another um, quote that she has in an essay called Weaving as a Metaphor. Um, that material is a means of communication. And I think that you know, a, a, a fundamental fascination and challenge for every novel is you know, what are the limits of expression and what are the limits yeah. of language? Yeah. And so, and to, to live in this moment too where it feels like it's so difficult sometimes to get at what the tangibly real is. And well, to have, it's also, yeah. when you're talking about finance, there's a very specific language associated with it that risks, I mean, I, from my point of view, is, Part of my professional experience was working on uh, articles about the Chinese economy that were somewhat impenetrable because of the jargon factor right. and the need to explain very, not even concepts, just like very complex bureaucratic procedures that were very foreign to an English or, in my case, British audience. Um, what were the ch and obviously you did a lot of research. For, what was what were the challenges on the level of language and fiction? Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that um, the language around uh, finance and especially uh, leading up to the financial crisis is so purposefully obfuscated to me is one of the primary reasons why we had uh, the crisis. And and this is one of the um, uh, in, in a way that it. People didn't even know anymore, uh, especially the rating agencies, possibly, um, what actually uh, lies behind the thing that is named. What am I? What am I actually buying? What am I actually selling? Um, and even a lot of people who did believe. It's a trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Right, credit default swaps. That was the. Yeah. Yeah. Collateralized debt yeah. obligations. Yeah. Right. You know. Yeah. This was the other passage I was thinking about reading. And there's a there's a line about um, Zoe's girlfriend when she tries to explain all this. Her face goes glassy, and I was imagining all of you um, yeah. <laughs> and thinking I would maybe read something different. It's an interesting question too, because the, the general population also has a an amazing ability to adapt to all these new terms. It's that, that in certain ways, or at least pretend to. I remember I have this old pal, and I was like, wow, suddenly the the, the nation's um, premier amateur epidemiologist. <laughs> right. um, yeah. But I, I mean, I, again. Writers are generalists. Yeah. Uh, he, that guy's not a writer. Uh, <laughs> but he is an epidemiologist. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess, so I, I, I guess the question is, do you feel, did you feel the need to lead the reader, or did you try to adjust your language to achieve something that might a lot, also, a lot of that language is going to be necessarily temporary, I would think. So were you looking to, to and I think you did it wonderfully, we, what were the challenges in trying to make something beautiful out of it? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, and appropriating a lot of, a lot of this language. And I, and I think that um, even the layman uh, reader, even if you, know, you haven't uh, you know, read Investopedia recently yeah. that the, that these are used um, and that these terms are, are used in a way where I, the uh, the challenge is to create a certain atmosphere, right? So most of this language um, is used in a uh, in a stretch where Zoe is uh, remembering what it was like to be on the trading floor during uh, during the financial crisis. Um, and in terms of making this uh, making the 
using this language and making it beautiful. I mean, I guess it is almost the old, I guess it's a spin on the old trope of making these in a manner strange. Because these, these, um, these terms uh, sound unfamiliar, but they're familiar insofar as they appear uh, really definitely not in literary fiction and really exclusively um, in, uh, in the news cycle. Do you think, in reality, they have a, they have a function of reinforcing the uh, class divide between winners and losers, and those people who are initiated into these forms of language, therefore, can become like Zoe? And, I think it's the primary function. Yeah, so that would be <laughs> yeah. one of the differences between Zoe and C, is that C is kind of lost in her, she makes all these attempts at teaching herself and counting. Right. You know, whereas Zoe is out there, like, Killing it, and all she needs is AIG to get bailed out, and then she she can just retire at 35. Right, right. Her game is um, how how to get as far away as possible from the black radius of, of this yeah. <laughs> um, of this imminent uh, uh, fallout. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we should probably open it up to our wonderful audience in a second, but I suppose. Uh, you, what is, there are a few different love stories in this book, and I guess they all kind of wind up somewhat tragically. Did you, did, you, did the system metaphor in your mind apply to both love and socia sociality within these, with these characters, particularly your thinking of Zoe, C, and Fran? Yeah, I don't know if it's, I mean, as I mentioned, I knew the end from the beginning. And I don't know if it's so much of a systems logic as um, the logic of a tragic arc. Um, you know, tragedies end a certain way. Um, and, you know, another, uh, another book that was maybe an influence on this was uh, Rachel Ingalls' Mrs. Caliban, who um, she was by Gibson and following these sorts of tragic arcs too. Um, and I mean, I, I do think that love um, is central uh, to the book. And I'm reminded again of if the book is toggling back between, um, back and forth between these different systems and their different logics, markets um, being one of them, then I always think of alternatives uh, to this, even just uh, touch, <laughs> and even being physically uh, present with other um, with others. And I was revising this during the pandemic, and I had come across Annie Albers and how much she had written about the importance of a tactile sensibility, and how this is a, a um, itself, you know, a means of communi communication um, and connection. And I think that that is a alternative that is, um, I hope, deeply felt uh, in, in the novel, and that longing to actually be physical, uh, physically present, to literally um, reach out to someone, especially when it feels that so many of the phenomena that are unfolding at larger scales, um, at the level of the economy, um, even at the level of uh, protest, um, in the art that you make, and then, and then you, you send it out <laughs> into um, the art market, um, that, that they're out of your control. Um, and so I hope that there is a sense of um, integrity in that, um, in the way that even if the relationships don't work out, um, you know, I think that that is more the, the power of um, other kinds of systems that are not in C's control, that are not in, in Zoe's control, more than it is a comment on uh, the integrity of the real tenderness that I think many of these characters have for each other. Well, now we are in another kind of market called a bookstore. <laughs> and we'd like to hear some questions from all of you. Whose goes first? <laughs> <laughs> ask a question. Um, should I just? It's okay if I just. So, art making, like, 
is a part of this market where the main character sells big tapestries to pay off some of her student debt and the only way she really makes money is that parents pay for her their kids to come and learn painting from her so art making for her is really a means to make money and it's part of this market and communication I mean art as communication is just another part of the market as communication and the exchange of funds and goods and surviving um, but you speak really optimistically about art making um, and uh, the way it might be in contrast to something like an economic market that would collapse and destroy lives. So do you think the art market, and then of course your first novel also had to do with the art market a little bit, but do you think, do you see the art market in this, the, the way that this novelist can use art to pay some of her bills or something, do you see that art should be seen as hopeful in the novel or is it, is it in line with the economic market that collapses? Should we feel just as cynically about it, or should we feel like there's some there's some refuge in in art making? Yeah, and you would answer that as a person or in the novel. I mean, it does feel like how do you get up in the morning? <laughs> how do you um, how do you you still write? Yeah, um, and I I feel I feel um, I mean yeah. I feel optimistic is a way that not so many sentences start um, <laughs> these days, but I, I feel um, committed to and optimistic about a will to communicate something. Um, and I think that that, uh, that is you know, another way of, of saying that I still believe <laughs> in, uh, in, in making art. I think that C is a bit extreme um, in a way, and that she's very much an esthete character. She would like to make her life um, a, a work of art, and so in the way that she relates to um, to, to selling work, to selling you know this huge piece, to having uh, watching people interpret it in a way that she, I think she's extreme, and that she couldn't uh, handle this, um, and, and in that way is very much uh, you know, a, a foil with Zoe, who very much has more of the attitude if a lot of people are going to make a lot of money and that's how this country works, why might as well be me, yeah. right? Um, and uh, so, but I, I hope that, um, I think that the, the book is, has its uh, sympathies and commitment to um, the, the will uh, to communicate and, and to express. Um, and I, so then we're searching for forms, <laughs> right? And there's also a contrast between public artistic creation and private right. secret artistic creation. Like, well, I'm trying to explain myself and stuff like this, but it might be a little of it. If you've read it, the Crystal Edwards novel so much. I love that book. Um, Can you say that again? Yeah, we didn't hear that. Oh, uh, <laughs> the book is. Sorry, we're having yeah, privacy. This is <laughs> <laughs> lunch, there's so much blue. I mean, you know, you guys are all here and you the <laughs> Percival Everett's so much blue. It's like, at the register. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, who's next? Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, right about this sort of slice of history. You find it hard not to sort of send it to like a polemic. I should have said that without mm. um, So a, a question, uh, do I find it hard not just to send into, into polemic? Um, interesting. I guess I would say, I mean, we, we mentioned the professor. I think that there are... Yeah, you have, you kind of, it becomes, I don't need to answer your question. It's kind of polyvocal. <laughs> Yeah. thing where you you got a gnome and a professor and a desperate character and it doesn't have to all be, there are many polemics in the book, they don't necessarily have to, in fact they probably are in contrast with the author's own point of view, which may not be entirely of a single line. Right? Okay. I mean, I think, yeah, I think the book uh, creates its own uh, polemic between these different characters and between these different views. And probably, you know, another influence um, on this book was um, 
you know, I, I really love the Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. Um, I love the ironic distance um, in, uh, to the characters uh, in this novel. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't love the Magic Mountain and don't find it very funny, which I think you should also uh, keep in mind. But, but one thing that I love about um, this novel is that it uh, creates uh, characters as ideas. And I think that the central characters, the central relationships, um, you know, for example, between C and Zo are uh, written as, as deeply human. But I think that there are other ways in which the book has manifested uh, certain characters and to give voice to ideas in a way that the gnome is sort of, you know, a, a Wikipedia <laughs> for, for these yeah, certain I, I, I characters. Yeah, I that thought <laughs> yeah. to me also. Um, and, uh, and then we have the goodnight group, you know, which is standing in for a certain worldview. We have the professor. And I think when, maybe this gets back to Christian's ori original question too, um, that finding that balance between these deeply human relationships and then giving voice um, to the essayists of the book who are evangelizing the polemicists, really, um, of, of the book, um, then I think that in the contrast between those points of view, the book is creating uh, its own. So maybe I didn't stay away from it after all. A follow-up there, since you mentioned the Goodnight Group. Um, if we think of the systems novel as a genre, examples that we may have read some of the same ones, um, does the role of the terrorist, is that a uh, figure in society whose function self-appointed function, so we should say, is to disrupt the system. Right. I'm trying to think of examples of systems novels that lack either a terrorist, as you get amount to, or, yeah, conspiracy, or in against the day, there's lots of anarchists, right? Um, and then... I'm a fan of the airborne event. The, the, yeah, white noise. White noise, that, 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 dis that dis that's an inhuman disruption. Um, but do, do you think, well, I don't know, this is kind of just an advanced question, do you think it's a genre requirement, formal? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to say yes. Because I was intrigued by the Goodnight Group, especially knowing that it was a historical or purely yeah. fictional. And, um, I mean, because there needs to be, if, if all uh, systems novels are in a way, I mean, you need some kind of awareness for the characters to recognize, um, oh, we were living in the system, I've become very aware of it, and now I'm questioning it. And in order to facilitate that awareness, you need some kind of disruption, or you need some sort of meta-awareness, or an outside perspective, or a comment on it. I thought about it. So when you when you frame it that way, I feel like there is a um, structurally necessary uh, function um, to a sort of well. I like to in my book it happens to be off stage, um, but it, as as a contrast um, that mostly mostly uh, mostly off stage. Yeah, thrills guys. <laughs> <laughs> <Lots of> thrills. <laughs> um, but I, I was thinking of it in terms, it, in the sense, um, in, insofar as the book uh, was also um, motivated by my own um, political thinking and frustrations, I also was interested in framing the question of at what point are extremes justified. Um, and in order to frame that, uh, to have a group that has these um, extreme tactics and to watch, I mentioned I started with kind of deliberately apolitical characters, and to watch an apolitical character become fascinated by something extreme, an extreme alternative to the status quo. Yeah, um, and, and to you know at first deny her fascination for this, find yourself attracted to it, find yourself attracted to it, is it um, a political attraction? Is it a truly a revolutionary attraction? Or is it an aesthetic attraction? Um, and, and to watch that process too, um, that was very interesting uh, to me. What does it take to um, uh, 
uh, begin with a, a relatively apolitical person who sort of wants to just be left alone to you know tend to her own uh, plot um, and to develop this fascination. Yeah, at one point she describes herself as petite bourgeois as a shop owner, and I was like, oh my god, is she going to no, we're going to get to Trump, or is she going to storm the Capitol? It does not. <laughs> it does not. still be true. We can still have nice things. Yeah. Um, um, so maybe I'll start formally with, with the way you know, you're painting uh, the voice of the novel as, as logical. Um, you know, this might sound like an underwhelming answer, but my first book was in first person, and I thought, well, this one, this one is coming to me in third person, and what does it mean to write in third person? in the age of uh, digital surveillance capitalism, because if you have this third person um, uh, narrator with a bit of uh, independence, um, you know, you're kind of just surveilling your characters uh, all the time. And I sort of wanted then, I, I was thinking then about studying and surveilling characters um, and, and having a, a voice or a consciousness of the novel um, that might sometimes act like an uh, amused algorithm <laughs> um, and, and be interested in sort of collecting uh, data on, on these characters and also in the sense that um, the book is deeply personal and, and feels human that um, maybe especially towards the end this is, this is hinted at but if we are reading this recent history and we find echoes in this story and in C's story with our present moment then you know we're sort of studying these characters so you know well yeah what should we do um, and and so there is uh, may, maybe that's influencing some of the the tone that you're discussing and I think that um, you know, do do I believe in truth I guess <laughs> is the, is the the or question consensus or consensus reality um, I, let's see, I, I almost feel that, do I believe in, um, I, I believe in consensus reality, but I also believe very strongly in phenomenological experience, um, and, uh, and the, the deeply private psychological um, uh, moments that we have, and that privately, as individuals, um, we are, um, this is reminding me kind of of Mrs. Dalloway. You tunnel into everyone's um, uh, deep uh, consciousness and their memories, and then you have Big Ben that is bringing everyone back to this consensus reality and consensus time. Um, it doesn't mean that these private experiences aren't real, but they're also not shared uh, in a way. And so I, I believe 
that there, there is a consensus reality, and I feel um, deeply uh, conviction about uh, convictions about searching for um, justice in that consensus reality. Um, and I also believe in the reality of our um, private and uh, haunted and um, you know, joyful spaces that don't really always make it to that, that public reality. And that, to me, is the purview of the novel. On another tactical note, I'd just like to say that beyond the uh, first person or third person question of narration, it's one of the best novels I've read recently told in the present tense. Hmm. At least since the last <laughs> bit see you. Um, yes. Did you, in the middle, yeah. I, I I work here. I was gonna oh. say, I was gonna say that's a beautiful place to wrap it up. I was All gonna right. I was actually gonna start clapping for Jesse. All right. <laughs>